Good day, Mount Moriah and guests. Welcome into the sanctuary of Mount Moriah Baptist Church for uh, another Bible study. Thank you for joining us. This is our stewardship month. Long before I came uh, to Mount Moriah, November was stewardship month in which we uh, look at our giving, both in reference to our resources, our time, our talents, uh, our gifts, as well as our earnings. And so during this month, I wanted to keep in line with that in reference to our Bible study. And if you are on Right Now Media, uh, I do encourage you to look at Jonathan Woods living generously. Uh, it looks at uh, Jesus' anointing at Bethany, and it talks about the generosity of Mary uh, from six or seven standpoints, time, attention, wealth, talents, possessions, perception, how we are perceived, and then comfort, living out of our comfort zone. So let me just read it, and then uh, today's lesson we will talk about living generously with, with wealth, specifically realizing that everything we have, God has given it to us, and we are not required to hoard it or to keep it to ourselves, but in fact, to share it with others generously. And if we do that, God will bless us with more so that we might be a blessing to someone else. So let me just read this, John chapter 12, verses 1 through 8. It reads, Six days before the Passover, Jesus arrived at Bethany, where Lazarus lived, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Here a dinner was given in Jesus' honor. Martha served while Lazarus was among those reclining at the table with him. Then Mary took about a pint of pure nard, an expensive perfume. She poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the fragrance of perfume. But one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was later to betray him, objected, why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? It was worth a year's wages. He did not say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. As keeper of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. Jesus replied, leave her alone. It was intended that she should save this perfume for the day of my burial. You will always have the poor among you but you will not always have me. Amen. Let us, let us pray. Father, we thank you and we praise you again for this opportunity to study your word, for your word is a lamp unto our, our feet and a light unto our path. We ask and pray that you would come and be the ultimate teacher here on today. In the name of the Christ, we pray and give thanks. Amen. So let me, let me just set the scene, you know, Mary and Martha, they had a brother named Lazarus. Lazarus was a, a friend of Jesus. Lazarus dies, and Mary and Martha request Jesus to come before he dies, in fact. And Jesus does not get there until after Lazarus dies. And Mary uh, said to uh, Jesus, look, if you had uh, been here, my, my brother would not have died. And Jesus basically uh, tells her, look, your, your brother will live again. She said that actually um, to, to Jesus. Mary does, and Martha responds. And Martha responds by saying, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. And Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life, and whoever believes in me will live even though he dies, and whoever lives and believes in me will never die. And so Jesus, as we know, uh, came to 
the tomb in which Lazarus was laid. And Jesus basically says, uh, take away the stone. And basically we see um, that Lazarus eventually comes out. Jesus tells him uh, to take off his grave clothes. And, and a man who has been uh, dead and in his tomb for four days now lives. Well, after that, there was a plot to kill Jesus. And this plot is in place uh, one day uh, during the Passover when Jesus was in Bethany where Lazarus lives. And there in Lazarus' house was this dinner given in Jesus' honor. Martha served while Lazarus and Jesus are reclining at the table. And while Mary, I'm sorry, while Martha served, Mary took this very expensive jar of perfume, poured it on Jesus' feet, and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with, with this fragrance. And so we talked about two weeks ago, or last week rather, what living generosity, what living generously looks like. It is the giving of your time. Mary sat at the feet of Jesus. Um, that was what she was supposed to do at that particular time. And we talk about how we get so busy in this Western world that many times we don't have the time to sit at Jesus' feet. But we must be uh, like um, Mary. Uh, we must be willing to sit at the feet of Jesus. So she took the time to do so. And, and then she gave uh, Jesus attention. She took this very expensive jar perfume by the pint made of pure nard and she anointed Jesus' feet. She paid attention to what was going on. She was attentive to what Jesus needed. And it is very, very interesting that this, this nard was an expensive, natural, calming oil that reduced anxiety and it, it was done because she was attentive. She, cho she chose the nod. She played attention. And so she was attentive also in the task, pouring this oil on the feet of Jesus. And not only that, but wiping his feet uh, with, with her hair. And we talked about how giving attention to people is very, very important in this day and time and how uh, if we paid more attention to what was going on instead of being on our cell phones uh, the world would be a, a much different place so we looked at time and attentiveness on last weekend and today uh, we want to talk about uh, living generously uh, with with our wealth God has, has blessed us with, with so much and God does not bless us with what God does for us to keep it to ourselves. Uh, but God has designed it so that when we open our hands to give, God can give us more in order that we might be able to bless more. If our hands are fist tight, then we can't give anything and we can't receive anything. So God requires us to live generously with our wealth. But when it comes to this notion of, of tithing, uh, God requires that we give uh, basically $1 out of every $10 that we make. Every $10 that we earn, God requires um, that we give $1. And when I say earn, I'm not just talking about from, uh, from a paycheck. Uh, but if 
whatever money uh, we go out and, and receive, whether it's through work, whether it's through selling something, God requires us to give one dollar out of every ten dollars to God. And God basically says, look, you keep the other nine uh, dollars, but just be a good steward of it. So we have to learn how much to give and how much to hold on to. And we have to hold on to something, right? Because we have bills to pay, we have mortgage, we got rent, we have insurances. Uh, many of us are, are preparing for retirement, et cetera, et cetera. We have to save for a rainy day. So how much do we give away? Uh, we know that 10% of our income is that what we give to God, but that's just, that's just a starting point. And let me just say, if you're not at 10%, it's okay to start where you are and, and work your, your way up. Jesus gave everything. And as we talked about on the third Sunday in October, in order to be a disciple of Jesus, we, we may have to give up everything, uh, everything we own, everything we possess in order to follow Jesus. Uh, Johnny Nash has a song, uh, There Are More Questions Than Answers. And the chorus goes something like this, What is life? How do we live? What should we take? How much should we give? And when it comes to living generously with our wealth, those last two questions for us as Christians is or are essential. What should we take? How much should we, we give? Uh, Jim Shepard, who writes on Christian giving, uh, wrote a book on the five stages of, of giving. And I like to call this five uh, discipleship stages of giving. Number one, the first stage is, and all of these are in the form of a question, what should I do with what I earn? What should I do with what I earn? And, and before I explain this, let me just say that they basically, uh, question one is at the lower level and the level we really want to be on is, is level five, but they build from uh, a lower degree to a higher degree. The first question, what do I do with what I earn? And in that particular case, we say, well, money is mine, I earned it, and I get to do whatever I want to do with it. And the reality of it is, is that what we earn is not ours. In fact, good stewardship tells us uh, that nothing we have belongs to us. It all belongs to God. The psalmist says, The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. Everything belongs to God. Nothing that is created has been created by us. This shirt that I have on, uh, even though uh, I may have uh, swipe my debit card and paid for it, it, it does not belong to me. It belongs to God because the material that it took to make this shirt, I could never create. It was created by God. And, and God wants me to be a steward over that which God has given me. So God is going to hold me accountable according to how well I take care of this shirt. So therefore, in order to be a good steward, um, I have to wash it or dry clean it, iron it, and, and take good care of it because God is going to hold me accountable for my stewardship. So the first question, what do I do with what I earn? Money is mine. No, it's not. I earned it and get to do what I want to do with it. No, we don't. Uh, the second question is, uh, what do I do with what God has given 
me. Money is God's. Our call is to do what we want to do with it. The money does belong to God, but it is not our call as to what we do with it. The third stage of giving, what does God want me to do with what God has given me? We at this point acknowledge that God has given us everything and we should use what God has given us for what God wants. So what does God want me to do with what God has given me? I think that that is a question that is essential for us who are trying to live generously with our wealth. The fourth question is, what does God want me to do? Or what does God want me to give from what God has provided? What does God want me to give from what God has provided? Not about how much we spend what God has given, but how do we give it away? Again, uh, we just can't hoard it for ourselves. If we hoard it for ourselves, our fists are closed, and therefore we can't receive anything from God and we can't give away anything. But God calls us to open our hands so that we can give and so that we can receive. Question uh, number five is, what does God want me to keep from what God has provided? So God wants us to, to give away some things and God wants us to keep what we need. So how much do we give away and how much do we keep for what we need? And I think that that is, that is the question or that is the stage that all of us as Christians should strive to be at. We want to be generous in our giving. We want to give away. But we also want to have an idea of how much we keep for what we need. The reality is, is that uh, what we have is a gift from God. Everything we have is a gift from God. And everything we have, God has given it to us. So the question for us as Christians who are trying to be good stewards is what I said a few moments ago. How much of our money should we give away? How much of God's money should we keep is the better phrase. So let me rephrase that. How much of God's money should we give away? Because it's not our money. It's God's money. How much of God's money should we give away? And how much of God's money should we keep? Again, uh, you know, we have, we have families. We have bills, mortgages, insurances, uh, car notes, cell phones, those type of things. And, and so we have to we have to decide, we just can't give away uh, everything unless it is required of us to sell everything and give everything away. Uh, but if, if we're going to live uh, in, in this world, we have to think about how much of God's money should we give away and how much of God's money should we keep. Just think, think, about, think about Mary here. Uh, Mary, uh, what she had, she gave, she gave back to God. She took about a pint of pure nard. And as, as I said, that nard was very, very expensive. It was like a relaxing um, oil. It was a natural oil, and it reduced anxiety. And, and so for Mary... It was not about the cost of the pure nard. That, that was what Judas worried about. He was worrying about the cost uh, of the perfume. Uh, Mary was not worried about that. Mary was practicing generosity. She was practicing extravagant generosity. Because the Bible says 
um, that that basically it, it does not say it in in John chapter uh, twelve, but it basically says in other places um, that this was this pint of nod was in the amount of a year's wages. And so Mary was willing uh, to sacrifice the feet of Jesus with a year's wages. She took a year's wages and she went and had this pure nard in her possession. And she poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped her hair, wiped his feet with her hair. And it says the whole house was filled with the fragrance of this perfume. What she was doing is that she realized that in a few days, um, Jesus would be uh, arrested and he would go uh, to the cross and he would eventually die. And what she was doing was that she was anointing uh, Jesus for burial. She was preparing Jesus for burial. But why did she do this? She did this because of what God had done for her brother Lazarus. She saw the love of God when Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. She experienced the love of Jesus Christ when he showed up and he ministered uh, to Mary and Martha and went to the tomb and raised Jesus from the dead. I'm sorry, raised Lazarus from the dead. So she experienced the love of Jesus Christ. She experienced the extravagant generosity of Jesus Christ. And she saw the generosity of Jesus Christ, and, and therefore uh, the generosity of Jesus Christ caught her attention, and therefore she was able to give generously as well. Now, we must possess the generosity of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ was generous. God has been generous to us, given us everything we possess. Jesus was so generous that he died on the cross and was resurrected for our sins. And so we must live a life um, that practices generosity. And we must get an understanding of what divine generosity is for us. However, we, we have to admit that in, in our world today that it's difficult for us to live up um, to marry in uh, giving up a year's wages. And again, we have to really decide in consultation with God how much of God's money should we give away and how much should we keep. Because in today's world, might be difficult for many of us uh, to give God a year's wages. And we have this Western mindset where the world tells us um, we are what we earn. And, and there are social pressures on us uh, in reference to what we buy and what we own. And then so many of us not all of us in the Western world live in some type of, of debt. And there are so many enticing ways to spend money. And I read uh, someone said that we live in tiny houses with big mortgages. Uh, that is the situation for so many of us who live uh, in the DMV. So it's hard to live up uh, to Mary. But we want to be able to give. And uh, we want to be able to possess the gift of giving. The gift of giving is a spiritual gift. And we want to be able to respond to God's gift of generosity by being generous to others. 
God has freely given to us and we want to be able to freely give to others. So we must pray uh, that God will give us the gift of generosity. And we must pray that we will be faithful in our generosity, which is, is contrary uh, to what we see going on in our, in our world today. Uh, Jesus says in Matthew chapter 6, verse 21, For where your treasure is, there your heart is also. So we want to have, we want to have, we want to possess uh, a generous heart. Let me just read uh, another passage of scripture, uh, and then we can, uh, we can close uh, for today. Uh, a scripture that you here at Mount Moriah have heard me preach from quite a few times. Uh, let me just read. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 6 through 12, where it rem says, Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each man should give what he has decided in his heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work as it is given. He has scattered abroad his gifts to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your generosity. You will be made rich in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion and through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. This service that you perform is not only supplying the needs of God's people, but is also overflowing in many expressions of thanks to God. Same thing, 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 6 through 12. If you sow sparingly, you reap sparingly. If you give sparingly, you reap sparingly. If you give generously you receive generously if you sow generously you will reap generously so we want to be we want to be cheerful givers we want to be able to receive uh, more than we give uh, so that we will be able to give some more and we want to have the generosity of Jesus Christ ingrained in our heart. Uh, we want to be uh, generous with our wealth. We want generosity to be woven into our lives. We want it to be a part of our thought process. We want to be generous with our wealth. So we want to be generous with our time. We want to be generous with our attention. We want to be generous with our wealth. And next week we will look at being generous with our gifts and talents. Thank you for your time and your attention on today. Let us pray. Father, we thank you and we praise you for this opportunity to study. And we thank you for being our ultimate teacher on today. Help us to have the gift of generosity. In the name of the Christ, we pray and give thanks. Amen.